Hello, and thank you for listening to this message from River of Life Church. If you enjoy this message, we want to encourage you to share it with a family member or a friend. Also, visit River of Life this Sunday at 1030 a.m. in Crawfordville. For service times and directions, visit rolcrawfordville.com. That's rolcrawfordville.com. Now, let's join special guest Keith Collins as he teaches from the Word of God. Many of you know that we value the presence of the Lord in this place. Amen. It is um, so powerful. You know, I, I love doctrine. I love Bible study. I mean, I love these things. I, I love the written word. Um, but the word and the spirit together yeah. is um, just so powerful and so needed in this generation. So thank you, River of Life, for being worshipers. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I am so honored to be here with you, with the Lord this morning. And Pastor Henry told me to introduce myself. So if you like this message, my name is Keith Collins. If you don't, my name is Henry Jones. So, so. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and if you don't care, then, then that, that's okay, too. <laughs> no, no, all serious. Um, just such an honor. Always a blessing to be back at River of Life and to be back in um, Wakulla County where I was raised. And so, so glad to see many familiar faces, some faces I don't recognize, which is a good thing. The Lord's adding to the house, adding to the ministry. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for the multiplication of souls. Amen. And I'm always blessed to hear that churches are baptizing people. You know, a lot of churches don't do that anymore. Amen. I know because I travel all over America and even overseas whenever I'm able to. But, but there's a lot of churches that I'll go to that they've not had a baptism in years. And whether it's because... No one's been born again or saved or they just don't do it. So um, let me know that we are commanded to, to baptize people. Amen. So I really honor you guys for being faithful to the word of God. And I'm excited about lives being changed. And baptism is a, an outward demonstration of what the Lord has done in the life of an individual. It's a public statement that we have been buried with Christ in baptism, raised in the likeness of Christ to walk in newness of life. So praise God. Amen. Well, this morning, um, I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I've been preaching for so long now. Henry said that to say you're a washed up preacher that used to be on staff. <laughs> I'm not trying to slam Henry this morning. <laughs> just, just, it, it was comical when he told me that. So, yeah. Um, you know, after 30, over 35 years, I started preaching as a kid, really a teenager. And um, after 35 years of, of over 35 years of preaching and pastoring and traveling and, you know, teaching, training missionaries and pastors and all the stuff that, you know, Darla and I have been blessed to do over these years. Um, you know, if, if I'm not careful, I can by default fall into a pattern of preaching. And, and actually, I... I really try to jar myself oftentimes because I don't ever want to be that type of a preacher to where I can just systematically come with a message. And, you know, there are times whenever the Lord puts me in a teaching setting and I enjoy that. But, um, you know, oftentimes I'm really just pressed by the Lord with, I believe, a word from heaven. And this this past Tuesday, I actually preached in um, Kannapolis, North Carolina this past Sunday and Tuesday morning in my prayer time. Early in the morning, I was up praying about this gathering, this service, this, this weekend. And the Lord, he doesn't always do this, but sometimes he does, literally just dropped the entire message into my heart, like in a matter of seconds. And um, I could show you on my phone this morning. I just got out and began to make a note on my phone with this theme, the scriptures, some of the points that I believe the Lord wants me to make here this morning. So I... I, I come with a sense of excitement, but also with a sense of sobriety and um, a sense of urgency as I look at the condition of our nation and so much of the world. So I want you to open your hearts to the word of the Lord this morning. I believe the Lord's going to encourage us, but I also believe that he's going to um, challenge us through the word of God this morning. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence in this house. We're actually overwhelmed that you love us so much that in your holiness, in your transcendency, in your power, Lord, you are a good father that bends your omniscience down towards us. And even though you're the, the ultimate judge in holiness, you're also the lover of our souls and you are gentle and you're merciful at the same time, Lord. Actually, we, we can't even describe you. You're just so worthy of praise and, and adoration. And we're humbled to be in your presence here today. And Father, I thank you for this family of believers. I thank you for this expression of your heart here in Wakulla County that you've birthed. And Lord, the lives that have been changed, that are being changed, that will continue to be changed. And Father, we, we bring... Wakulla County, we bring the state of Florida, we bring the United States of America before you this morning. Our nation needs you, Lord. The church in America needs you, Jesus. Father, awaken hearts in here today. Awaken individuals in here today. Fathers, mothers, young people. Awaken us, stir us as only you can. Lord, if there's any dust on us, just knock it off. God, whatever has to happen. In order that we might be perseverant in your purposes, God. Anoint this word and use it to change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, the Lord spoke to my heart very clearly early Tuesday morning in my office in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he told me, he said, remember Hebrews chapter 10. And of course, I've, I've read Hebrews many times. I've taught on the book of Hebrews. But... But I went and, and began to read chapter 10 again. When I came down to the last part of that chapter, I knew what the Lord was speaking to my heart. So I want to start in verse 35 of Hebrews 10 this morning and read a few verses. And then we will go into Jude this morning as well for a little bit. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. The writer of Hebrews says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Why? For you have need of endurance. Now, some translations use the word perseverance. I actually like both words. But the writer says you have need of perseverance or endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come. And will not tarry. How many of you believe that Jesus is still coming back? Can I tell you a lot of the church doesn't even preach that anymore. Amen. Listen. Yet a little while and he is coming. He will come and he will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But listen to this. But if anyone draws back. My soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, now the, the narrative or the, the verses here dictate to us that there has to be this adherence to perseverance and to endurance. In other words, oftentimes I believe our Christianity is promoted or even taught as this easy form of believism where you and Jesus come into a partnership and everything's good and you just kind of sail through and live your own life the way that you've always been living. Friend, that is not salvation. If you go into the, the first part of chapter 10, and I won't spend a lot of time there because I do want to get through some, some notes this morning, but if you go into the, the first part of chapter 10, you'll understand the word therefore. In other words, be because of these things, and, and of course there's teaching about the law and about grace, and then the writer of Hebrews really in this part of the book, um, our letter really goes into the practical application of living by faith through grace, living a life of righteousness. But he says, listen, you will have need of endurance and perseverance. Now let me read one more narrative or one more um, set of verses to you this morning. Jude 1 through 3. Jude's only one chapter. So Jude 1 through 3 this morning. You know, it's interesting how much of the Bible is written 
to contradict or to put a buffer against false teaching, heresy. Um, there's a word that maybe you know it, antinomianism. In other words, there's, there's, there's a good amount, a good percentage of the New Testament, if you read it, that's really written in order to encourage and challenge the people of God not to fall into deception. Not, not to fall away from the foundations of our faith, the, the, the elements of salvation, the things that make us the people of God. So when we come to Jude, we, we find that this book really combats some of these things. So look at Jude verses 1 through 3. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preser preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Because certain men have crept in unnoticed or unawares, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are two very distinct um, warning flags that we have from the writer of Hebrews. Whether it was Paul or not, is, there's good debate on that. But anyway, we know that, that Hebrews is inspired of the Lord. So from the writer of Hebrews and also from Jude, we are challenged in our walk with God. We are encouraged in our walk with God to, to dig in deep to the foundations of our faith and not to be easily swayed or easily taken off the path. You know, the Bible says that um, straight is the gate to salvation and few there be that find it, right? But, but broad is the way to destruction. Well, can I tell you something this morning? There is a lot of broad ways that have come even into the church of the United States of America. Yeah. I know people myself, and I, I won't go into names this morning, but I, I know people personally that two and three years ago, were solid teachers of the word of God that have now not just went into heresy, but some even into apostasy in the sense that they have literally forsaken the gospel and salvation, completely denying the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we find ourselves in a challenging season. Well, I could quote 2 Timothy 3, this know also in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemer, all, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, incontinent, truce breakers, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but deny I me. Mean, we could see that, and, and clearly we're in the last days. To be honest with you, we've been in the last days since Jesus was born. Theologically, if you study the word of God, that's when the last days began. Now, the, the, the question this morning, and oftentimes, every time there's conflict in the Middle East, I get calls from former students or emails. Hey, Pastor Keith, is this like the last of the last days? <laughs> right? Or if something crazy goes on in the world, I mean, I, I, and even young pastors that I'm blessed to mentor and pour into their, their lives, they'll correspond with me. Is this like, is this it? Is this the, the final show? Is this the end of the end? And I always tell them that, you know, we don't know exactly when the Lord's coming back. I mean, even Jesus said he'll come like a, a thief in the night. You won't even know when he's coming, but he'll come. But I will tell you this. And I'm not telling you this as a theologian because I don't claim to be one. I study the word intently. But, but listen, I, I'm telling you this as someone that has common sense in Christ. I, I'm telling you this as someone who is looking at the condition of our generation. I'm telling you someone who knows that Israel became a state or a nation again in 1949. I'm telling, or 48, I'm telling you something as I, I'm telling you this as I look at the condition of our world and the continual degeneration and antichrist attack on culture and on society. And I'm not telling you that Jesus is coming back in a year or five years or 10 years, but I'm telling you this, my friend. 
These are ominous days. And only those that are adhering to truth, to purity, to righteousness will stand in the hour that we live in. The Bible says if it were possible, even the very elect of God would be deceived. Now listen to me. There is a great deception in this hour. And I am talking to you this morning on something I'm simply calling we have need of endurance, of perseverance. Listen, I am someone that loves life. I, I do. I enjoy life. I enjoy family. I enjoy vacation. I killed a big old 23 pound turkey in West Virginia this year by the grace of God. I enjoy deer hunting. I killed three deer in West Virginia this past fall. I, I enjoy fishing. I, en I enjoy mission trips. I enjoy pouring into leaders. I enjoy being with church people, fellowship. I mean, I enjoy all of these things. My, my life is full of joy. But you listen to me. I also recognize that I am on a battlefield until I go by way of the grave or until Jesus comes back and receives his church. I, I realize that this is a, a war that we're in. And there's a battle for the soul, not just of our nation, but for the soul of the church in the United States of America. I was in the United Kingdom several years ago, maybe 99, 2000. And I was in the little nation of Wales. And Wales is known as the land of revivals. They've had great moves of God over the years. 1800s and of course... The notorious revival that broke out in 1904 in Lockhart Wells at Mariah Chapel, where God used Evan Roberts, a young 26-year-old man, and great revival hit the entire nation. But I did something one afternoon. I went out on the street with another leader, and we were asking two questions. Have you ever heard of the Welsh revival, and have you ever heard of Evan Roberts, the revivalist? Out of maybe, I don't know how many, 70, 80 people, maybe a few more, most of them younger Everyone we asked, one person thought they had heard of the Welsh Revival. And one person thought maybe they heard of Evan Roberts when they were in school. Now my, my, my point in giving you that story is this. Not only is Wales post-revival, but they have become post-Christian on many levels. What am I saying? I'm saying that a lot of the church in Wales has lost the ability to endure and to persevere. Now, let me give you some good news because I don't want to just sound all hard and, and, and challenging up here. But I, I'm giving you facts. But listen, let me give you good news. Even though in America, statistically, Christianity is waning. Look at Pew. Look at Barna. I mean, I study these, these statistics just to know what's going on. There is a, especially among the crowd of like 13 to 35, there's a great um, waning or a great falling off of people that even claim to believe in God. Even though that's the case, I will tell you that in places like Africa, in places like Asia, in places like South America, Christianity is booming in China, in Iran, in Yemen, in many parts of the world where there is intense persecution, there is also great spiritual revival that is taking place in the midst of the persecution. I don't know what's going to happen to America. I do know when a nation flips their nose at God and tells him that we no longer need your protection, we no longer need your statutes, we no longer need your rules and your, your truths. When a nation does that, she stands in danger of judgment. Now you listen to me this morning. When I study the word of God, I see two types of judgment. I see judgment that is very much played out. In other words, we can look at Old Testament stories, Sodom and Gomorrah. God judged that city for their perversion. Rain down hellfire and brimstone, sulfur, all that kind of stuff. We, we look in the New Testament when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit about a piece of land. They were struck dead. These are challenging stories, but I didn't write them. But in other words, that, that's like an executed judgment. But can I tell you another kind of judgment that I see? 
Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Proverbs, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You listen to me this morning. There is another type of judgment where the Lord will give men over to their own lustful appetites and ungodliness. And as a result, anarchy begins to break out in our cities. As a result, fear begins to grip a society. As a result, there's division among the generations, among the races. Why? I believe oftentimes because men no longer, women no longer acknowledge their need for God. Can I tell you, we have need of perseverance, my friend. I, I still believe that Jesus is saving the lost. I still believe that when the truth of the gospel is preached in power with demonstration, that lives are radically touched and radically changed. At the same time, darkness seems to be getting darker. At the same time, men's hearts are waxing cold. At the same time, you, some of you that are my age, or maybe even maybe 40 year olds and a little older, I'll be 53 in September, but my age and even older than me, most of you can remember a time in America and in Wakulla County where you could go and to talk to someone young or old about the Lord. And there was at least a uh, somewhat of a, a natural reception, even though they might not have really given their heart to the Lord, there was at least an acknowledgement that that this could be real, that this is true, and this is what I need to do. We live in a culture now. A culture now where many people have no frame of reference for the Lord Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. We live in a generation now that is being taught, even through education, that God is not real. They're being taught that there is no need for change in your life, that, that you are your own change agent. Now listen to me, what we want in much of our culture in this generation, even in the church, we want a God created in our image instead of acknowledging that we are created in his image. Because you see, if, if God is created in my image, then he understands my rebellion and he's okay with it. Then, then I don't have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I can live unto myself. I can become my own God. I can become my own authority. And this is the hour that we find ourselves in. I want to read some things to you because I felt like the Lord gave me these things. So before I get too far into this, let me share some things with you. In America, it is obvious that there has been a cultural shift over the decades that now brings us to a time of great conflict regarding the role of religion in culture, more specifically Christianity. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Islam is all right, even though they're way more radical than we are about certain issues, but still it's okay to talk about that. Hinduism is fine. Shintoism. All these isms that I've studied all these years. And listen. But when you begin to talk about Jesus. <laughs> look out buddy. Look out. Listen. This is because Jesus Christ. Brings humanity to a decision. Regarding their fate. Whether they like it or not. Do you know the Bible says that God has put eternity in the heart of every person, every man, every individual? I mean, there's, there's different definitions on that, but let me give you a good biblical understanding of that. In other words, there is something on the inside of every individual that when truth is proclaimed because their very existence comes from God himself, there is something on the inside of them that recognizes something about the gospel. 
of Jesus Christ. You ever, you ever wondered, you know, I've studied a lot of atheists just because I want to know what they think. But it's interesting how angry they are about somebody they don't even believe in. You know why they're angry? They're angry. Let me tell you why they're angry. They're angry because something inside of them knows that this is real. And in their rebellion and in their anti-God stand, they resist him like a football player stiff-arming someone. They, they push him out of their life. They don't want to deal with that Jesus stuff. Can I tell you something? Jesus will get up in your face. <laughs> he really will. He'll bring you to the place where you have one option, two options. To turn away from him or to fall on him. And acknowledge your dependency. You see, we've preached. I know you haven't done this here. But a lot of the church in America. Has preached another gospel in recent decades. Paul spoke of another gospel. Another spirit and another Christ. They have preached another Jesus. They have said Jesus is really Santa Claus. Who died on a cross. And if you come to Jesus, he's going to give you everything you want, sweetheart. This is who Jesus is. He'll, he'll fix you. He'll give you money. He'll take you. And let, can I say this? He does bless us. Listen, I live a blessed life. Not because I deserve it, but because I've been faithful to the Lord. And I believe the blessings of God come to a life that has been given over to the Lord. I'm, I'm blessed. So I don't disparage that. But can I tell you something? The call to follow Jesus is not so you can have a better life. The call to follow Jesus is humble yourself before your creator because he's the, the one that laid his life down for you and shed his blood for you. And he is worthy to receive the reward of his sufferings. It doesn't matter if I don't have a pot to pee in, as the old people used to say. It doesn't matter, friend, as long as I know what he did to change my life, that's enough. That's enough this morning. He's worthy of my money. He's worthy of my time. He's worthy of my attention. He's worthy of prayer. He's worthy of, listen, as we worship this morning, you know why we worship? Because there's an acknowledgement in the house of his worthiness. He's worthy, friend. These things must be maintained in our midst. You see, many... In our nation, especially under the age of 35, 40, have embraced a postmodern view that is void of any absolutes or grounded biblical truths. Now, I've, I've got a free book. I, I think it'll be done not this Friday, but the following Friday. We're finishing the cover. It's a, it's a small book, but I felt like the Lord wanted me to write it. I, I recently um, taught a seminar, about an eight-hour seminar, to several pastors in the Northeast on the subject of postmodernism and dualism, secularism, humanism. And I, I've written fairly extensively on this, but, but I wanted to take a lot of my material that I've written and kind of boil it down to about a 50, 60 page booklet. And um, that'll be available free by PDF on our website. And I'll also start bringing those out and giving them to people. But, but listen, the reason that I, I felt to really invest some time in learning about this is because... When I first got saved, and I could go to Florida State, and I would do this, and I could witness to those students up there, and many of them had an acknowledgement that what I was saying is real. I could go to Florida State today, and when I talk about Jesus, many of them would look at me like a mule looking at a new gate. Like, they don't even know what you're talking. That's the truth. They don't even know what you're talking about. Through, through postmodernism, through deconstructionism, all these types of things. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail. You can get the book free and read it. But listen, through a lot of these attacks of the enemy, we have seduced and deceived an entire generation. It's no wonder they're hopeless and addicted and, and depressed and suicidal. They have no identity in who Christ says that they are. And the world told them you could fulfill it through education through financial success, and they all come crashing down eventually because there's no joy and hope 
aside from a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, listen, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. We live in a generation where it's the gospel and. I still believe that Jesus can set the captive free. I still believe if you confess your sins to Christ and you humble your heart before Jesus and you fall on the rock before he falls on you and crushes you to powder, the scripture says, if you fall on Jesus, your life can be transformed. It's the gospel. If I didn't believe this for not, I quit doing this a long time ago. We need the power of the gospel preached in our generation again we need men and women that are not compromising we have need of endurance my friend we have need of perseverance many in our nation and especially those again younger people have lost any foundations and what's what's the result the result is a natural implosion of society is being played out right before our eyes. As the family is under siege, the creative order of male and female is under siege. God's pattern for marriage is under attack. Basic honor, decency, and respect are becoming obsolete in our culture. Ungodliness and perversion are being held as good and even moral. George Orwell said, the further a society drifts away from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak the truth. Amen. And we are in that hour, my friend. You see, even in the church, as I said, there has been a great rise in heresy and even apostasy. Many have turned away from the Lord and away from truth. Many, can I say this, are ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because in our enlightened, educated, postmodern world, that old stuff just doesn't work anymore. That is a lie from hell. The gospel, the power of God unto salvation, friend. The only hope for America is Jesus and the gospel. The only hope for the church yeah. is a re let's we talk about revival a lot and I love those things but listen we need a revival of just pure preaching the gospel again. Yeah. We've got a seminar for everything. You want to learn how to take care of your money, you want to learn how to treat your wife right, quit being such a butt. I mean on I mean whatever I mean listen listen friend there's a seminar there's training for everything, and all those things can be good. But you listen to me. We need the gospel again. The gospel transforms hearts. The gospel changes families. The gospel changes your lifestyle. It's the gospel, friend. It's that simple, but it's that profound. Now, how should we respond in the midst of a culture that has rejected God, even within sectors of the church. I'm going to go through these quickly. Number one, if you're writing notes, this is number one. We must endure or persevere in purity and in the fear of the Lord. Purity of life and also purity of, of doctrine, I believe. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I or finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarn you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. For we must endure 
endure. We must persevere in purity of life. Now listen, I'm not talking about legalism, rules without relationship. But I'm talking about walking with Jesus Christ. Knowing Him as your Lord and your Savior, your Master, the lover of your soul. And out of an intimate relationship with Him, we are empowered by grace to be who God has called us to be. Paul said this, There is no temptation taken you but such as common to man. But God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will also with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. What is Paul saying? There is grace to live a life of righteousness through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, there is a great pushing away of these truths. The rise of antinomianism or lawlessness is, is pandemic in much of the church. And I believe in recent months we've seen the weakness of so much of the church when we went through some things because of the weakness in our teaching and in our, in our living, a lack of perseverance. But I'm telling you, there is grace through intimacy to live a life of righteousness. That honors the Lord. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a bad day. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a cross word. But I tell you this. We should be growing in grace. We're, we're called to the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. All these things. This is who we're called to be. Lives of righteousness. We must persevere in purity. Number two. We must endure or persevere in fellowship or in community. Hebrews 10 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Listen, your walk with God has to be more than your Sunday morning church attendance. I was blessed to hear that you guys are going to start eating in the fellowship hall again. Not because you just get free food this coming week. or you're, But listen, friend, that's, that's where it gets real. Whenever you begin to connect with people, when you begin to, to call people and say, Hey, man, why don't we go out to lunch next week? Or maybe you and your, your wife should come over to our house. And you begin to pour your lives into each other. We used to have, back when I was at... Salt Choppy First Baptist on staff years ago with Pastor Henry. We used to have what I think they called them hallelujah parties. I remember being at Dallas and Diane's different times. And man, just the, the praise, the worship, the prayer. But beyond that, just the fellowship. You could feel the saints of God strengthening one another. Listen, we are not called to be islands unto ourselves. We must persevere in fellowship and in community. It builds us up in the faith, especially in the hour that we live in, where there's so much attack and so much deception. Let us be perseverant in fellowship and in community. Number three, just a couple more, three more. We must endure or persevere in persecution. This isn't popular, but it's, it's biblical. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The truth of the gospel will always contradict the spirit of the age. As we fasten ourselves to the absoluteness of Jesus being the only way of salvation. Jesus said he came to bring a sword, right? Can I tell you, friend? It is our absoluteness that offends the world. In other words, for Keith Collins to stand at River of Life in Crawfordville, Florida this morning, and I know this will probably go out on the internet later, but listen, for me to say that, listen, there is no other way to salvation except Jesus. That Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through him, that except the Spirit of God draws someone. Listen, he is the only way. For me to say that is very offensive in a pluralistic, universalist generation. 
But it will, be, it, it will be one of the main separating things as we go further into the last days. There are many that want to make it to heaven. Many that want eternal life. But not everyone wants to come through the cross and through Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing on this platform, I would rather die than compromise this foundational truth of the gospel. There is no ministry, real ministry, without this truth being in place. Every other teaching is a lie, it is deception, and it is sucking even some of the great ministers in the past into this deceptive lie. We must persevere, even in persecution. Cut off the honorariums, take away the tax status, get rid of the parking places, the platforms, and the paychecks, and the pulpits, and let's see who's still preaching the gospel, friend. I believe we're living in a day where we're going to have to stand for something that's real and authentic. Why? Because our nation is free falling into hell this morning. And oftentimes the church is pushing it there because of our lack of boldness and clarity when it comes to truth. What is love? Love is not letting a kid get run over in that highway. Love is getting that kid out of that highway and even tanning that rear end so they'll never go back out there again. God's called us to be truthful. This is who we're called to be. Listen to the words of Jesus. Let me comfort you with these words. John 15, 18 through 20. Some of you that know your Bible just said, uh-oh. If the world hates you, this is Jesus, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the world, or, or, or remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus, they will also persecute you. Can I tell you something, friend? The spirit of the age is not going to accept the true gospel and say, oh, this is so great. Let's just love and live together and we'll just be in unity. Friend, there is no unity without truth. And we're supposed to be the most loving, compassionate, humble, giving people. But friend, if you ever throw compromise into the mix, all that other stuff doesn't matter. Yes. It is our unwillingness to compromise the bloody body of Jesus hanging on a horrific yet glorious cross that makes us different. And that's visual and that's challenging, but that's the gospel, friend. He radically laid his life down to purchase you and me. When we vacate that truth, then Jesus, if that's true, and, and there's other ways, then Jesus wasted his time on the cross. I'm telling you, he is the only way. And persecution will come. Matter of fact, it, it, it's coming. I had a message from a dear friend. I, I preach in Canada. Usually often. I've not been there in a while because of the virus. Dear friend in his 70s. Been pastoring for 40 something years. The persecution in our neighboring country. The suppression of truth. Where now it's against the law to even use certain words in a pulpit. And they have the Right, they'll come and padlock your door. Just for, can I tell you something? Um, we ain't far from that in parts of America right now. And if certain forces have their way, we will be there, friend. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not, I'm just not wired to compromise. <laughs> Paul said, by life or, or even by death. He said, if... If I live, that's good for you. If I die, that's really just better for me. <laughs> you see, friend, this gospel calls us to another dimension, the eternal realm. This world, the old people used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Remember those old songs? Maybe some of those songs need to be rethought about again, friend. Some of these folks, that, that eternal paradigm. That captures our hearts and our passion. This world is not my home, friend. I'm a pilgrim passing through. One life to live. 
One shot, no rewind button. I hadn't found one yet. I mean, I look in the mirror, I don't look like I did 20, 30 years ago. There, there's no rewind button, right? You got one, one shot at this. And I'm going to tell you something. If you live God in Christ Jesus, if you refuse to compromise the truth of the gospel, you will suffer persecution. Some more than others. Some of my dearest friends are with the Lord today. They, they, they lost their life for the gospel. I, I was with a dear brother six years ago in India. We prayed over 100 pastors that had graduated from a two-year school. And we sent them out, laid hands on them. The leader there told us some of these will probably never really build a ministry. And I knew two, two of these young men were killed by radical Hindu groups. The thought, though, as he told us that laying hands on them, their willingness to go, even in the face of persecution. Friend, this is the gospel. This is life and death. This is why River of Life is in Crawfordville, Florida. Not just to be another church. I mean, we need to be a people that embrace this county, that bless this county. Don't misunderstand me, but listen, friend. We are a beacon. This place is a lighthouse that's been erected by the Lord. A banner of truth is over this place as we stand for righteousness and purity in an ungodly world. This is why we're here. Two more. Matter of fact, I'm going to have you stand. That way I'll be quiet soon. Two more. Not only must we endure in persecution, but we must endure or persevere in prayer this morning. Yes. James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses or your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Paul, Ephesians 6, 18. He's talking about the armor of God with all prayer and petition. Pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. I challenge you to look at the prayer life of the early church. Beyond that, look at the prayer life of Jesus, the son of man, Jesus. We know he was God, but he would literally steal away into the night or get up early in the morning, go to a mountain, cry, vehement cries unto the father. Friend, the church has to be a people of prayer now more than ever. Right. Paul told us in Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. If we're not a people of prayer, then what we do can be done through human ingenuity and human strength. But when prayer is involved, the breath of eternity breaks forth. And the assistance and the grace of heaven is on everything that we do. We must persevere in prayer. We must pray through we must be a Romans 8 people. As Paul said, there are times when the Holy Spirit comes upon us through groanings that cannot even be uttered because the Holy Spirit knows the heart of the Father and He uses our yielded vessels to pray through us. This is who we are and we must be that people now more than ever. As the musicians come back, my last point is this. We must also... And this is important. Endure or persevere in hope. I mean, we are not a hopeless people, friend. Listen, I can paint a dark picture of our culture. But friend, this ain't my home. You understand? Oh, I love this world. And the Lord's put me here to do a work for him. And my, my goal is to rescue as many as I can from hell. But friend, my hope is not in the American economy. My hope is not in the next president or the next senator from Florida or whatever, or the next governor. I mean, we pray the way we pray for righteous leaders. But friend, my hope is in Jesus. I read the Bi I've read the Bible through many times and I've read the end of it many times. I know how this ends. I know how it ends. Let me close reading this scripture to you. But I, don't, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13. Concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say... 
to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, I still believe this, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let me close with this quote and I'm going to pray and we're going to open this altar this morning. There are people in here that the Lord's dealing with your heart. Friend, this is an amazing morning for you. Jesus loves you so much that, that, that he wants you to hear his truth. He wants to set you free. Set you free from the enemy. Set you free from the power of the enemy. But also set you free from yourself. There's freedom in Christ from your addictions, from your depressions. It doesn't come just by snapping a finger. No, it comes by giving your heart deliberately to Jesus. There's others in here this morning. The Lord's calling you into a deeper place of perseverance, friend. It's not just a Sunday morning service or a Wednesday night Bible study. Those things are very important. You need to be here. Friend, this, is, this, this should be more real when you walk outside this dome than it is when you're in this dome. My heart is that your heart would burn for Jesus like it never has before. That you would have a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit this morning to do the works of Jesus in your generation. What color county needs the works of Jesus done, friend? How does he do that? Through you, through me. Through yielded vessels of perseverance. Listen to what Jim Elliott the missionary martyred in Ecuador said many years ago, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I want you to bow your heads this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we humble our hearts before you this morning. We thank you, God, for truth that, that cuts through the clutter, cuts through the confusion, cuts through all the excuses. And Lord, just brings us to you. Father, I, I, I pray this morning that, that you would touch hearts in this place. Lord, if there are those that do not know you this morning as Lord and Savior, that this is the day of salvation. This is the day of repentance. This is the day of humbling our hearts before you. And Father, those here this morning that, that would simply say, Lord, I, I want my life to be used for your glory. I, I want to entrench. I want to be perseverant. Father, I pray that you would stir them in a new and a fresh and in a radical way. And Father, I, I pray for this church, this expression of your kingdom here in this county. Father, we know there is vision that is alive here, that's been alive here for many, many years. Father, may the next phase be glorious beyond compare. May there be an amazing harvest, God. Let lives be radically touched. Raise up disciples who will go out and make disciples, Lord. Your kingdom come now this morning. In Jesus' name. Thank you again for viewing this message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today or if you need somebody to pray with you, please let us know. You can also call us at 850-926-1200 or send an email to info at riveroflifefl.com. We also encourage you to check out River of Life Live this Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. in Crawfordville. Visit rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.